It was time to go, time to test my powers. I filled my purse and my pockets with as much money as they would comfortably hold, and I buckled on a jeweled sword that was not too old-fashioned, and then went down locking the iron gate to the tower behind me. The tower was obviously all that remained of a ruined house, but I picked up the scent of horses on the wind strong. Very nice smell, perhaps the way an animal would pick up the scent, and I made my way silently around the back to a makeshift stable. It contained not only a handsome old carriage, but four magnificent black mares. Perfectly wonderful that they weren't afraid of me. I kissed their smooth flanks and their long, soft noses. In fact, I was so in love with them, I could have spent hours just learning all I could of them through my new senses. But I was eager for other things. There was a human in the stable also, and I'd caught his scent too as soon as I entered. But he was sound asleep, and when I roused him, I saw he was a dull-wilted boy who posed no danger to me. I'm your master now, I said, as I gave him a gold coin, but I won't be needing you tonight except to saddle a horse for me. He understood well enough to tell me there was no saddle in the stable before he fell back to dozing. All right. I cut the long carriage reins from one of the bridles, put it on the most beautiful of the mares myself, and rode out bareback. I can't tell you what it was like, the burst of the horse under me, the chilling wind, and the high arch of the night sky. My body was melded to animal. I was flying over the snow, laughing aloud and now and then singing. I hit high notes I had never reached before, then plunged into a lustrous baritone. Sometimes I was simply crying out in something like joy. It had to be joy, but how could a monster feel joy? I wanted to ride to Paris, of course, but I knew I wasn't ready. There was too much I didn't know about my powers yet, and so I rode in the opposite direction until I came to the outskirts of a small village. There were no humans about, and as I approached the little church, I felt a human rage and impulsiveness breaking through my strange, translucent happiness. I dismounted quickly and tried the sacristy door. Its lock gave and I walked through the nave to the communion rail. I don't know what I felt at this moment. Maybe I wanted something to happen. I felt murderous and lightning did not strike. I stared at the red glare of the vigil lights on the altar. I looked up at the figures frozen in the unilluminated blackness of the stained glass. And in desperation, I went up over the communion rail and put my hands on the tabernacle itself. I broke open its tiny little doors and I reached in and took out the jeweled ciborium with its consecrated hosts. No, there was no power here. Nothing that I could feel or see or know with any of my monstrous senses. Nothing that responded to me. There were wafers and gold and wax and light. I bowed my head on the altar. I must have looked like the priest in the middle of mass. Then I shut up everything in the tabernacle again. I closed it all up just fine so nobody would know a sacrilege had been committed. And then I made my way down one side of the church and up the other. The lurid paintings and statues captivating me. I realized I was seeing the process of the sculptor and the painter. Not merely the creative miracle. I was seeing the way the lacquer caught the light. I was seeing little mistakes in perspective, flashes of unexpected expressiveness. What will the great masters be to my eyes, I was thinking. I found myself staring at the simplest designs, painted in the plaster walls. Then I knelt down to look at the patterns in the marble until I realized I was stretched out, staring wide-eyed at the floor under my nose. This is getting out of hand, surely. I got up, shivering a little and crying a little and looking at the candles as if they were alive and getting very sick of this. Time to get out of this place and go into the village. For two hours I was in the village, and for most of that time I was not seen or heard by anyone. I found it absurdly easy to jump over the garden walls, to spring from the earth to low rooftops. I could leap from a height of three stories to the ground, and climb the side of a building, digging my nails and my toes onto the mortar between the stones. I peered in windows, I saw couples asleep in their ruffled beds, Infants dozing in cradles, old women sewing by feeble light, and the houses looked like doll houses to me in their completeness. Perfect recollections of toys with their dainty little wooden chairs and polished mantelpieces, mended curtains and well-scrubbed floors. I saw all this as one who had never been a part of life, gazing lovingly at the simplest details. A starch white apron on its hook, worn boots on the hearth, a pitcher beside a bed, and the people. Oh, the people were marvels. Of course I picked up their scent, but I was satisfied, and it didn't make me miserable. Rather, I doted upon their pink skin and delicate limbs. 
the precision with which they move, the whole process of their lives, as if I had never been one of them at all. That they had five fingers on each hand seemed remarkable. They yawned, cried, shifted in sleep. I was entranced with them, and when they spoke, the thickest walls could not prevent me from hearing their words. But the most beguiling aspect of my explorations was that I heard the thoughts of these people just as I had heard the evil servant whom I killed. Unhappiness, misery, expectation, these were currents in the air, some weak, some frighteningly strong. Some no more than a glimmer gone before I knew the source. But I could not, strictly speaking, read minds. Most trivial thought was veiled from me, and when I lapsed into my own considerations, even the strongest passions did not intrude. In some, it was intense feeling that carried thought to me, and only when I wished to receive it. And there were some minds that even in the heat of anger gave me nothing. These discoveries jolted me and almost bruised me, as did the common beauty everywhere I looked, the splendor in the ordinary. But I knew perfectly well there was an abyss behind it, into which I might quite suddenly and helplessly drop. After all, I wasn't one of these warm and pulsing miracles of complication and innocence. They were my victims. Time to leave the village. I'd learned enough here. But just before I left, I performed one final act of daring. I couldn't help myself. I just had to do it. Pulling up the high collar of my red cloak, I went into the inn, sought a corner away from the fire, and ordered a glass of wine. Everyone in the little place gave me the eye, but not because they knew there was a supernatural being in their midst. They were merely glancing at the richly dressed gentleman, and for twenty minutes I remained testing it even further. No one, not even the man who served me, detected anything. Of course, I didn't touch the wine. One whiff of it, and I knew that my body could not abide it. But the point was, I could fool mortals. I could move among them. I was jubilant when I left the inn. As soon as I reached the woods, I started to run. And then I was running so fast that the sky and the trees had become a blur. I was almost flying. Then I stopped, leapt, danced about. I gathered up stones and threw them so far I could not see them land. And when I saw a fallen tree limb thick and full of sap, I picked it up and broke it over my knee as if it were a twig. I shouted, then sang at the top of my lungs again. I collapsed on the grass laughing, and then I rose, tore off my cloak and my sword, and commenced to turn cartwheels. I turned cartwheels just like the acrobats at Renault's, and then I somersaulted perfectly. I did it again, and this time backwards, and then forward, and then I turned double somersaults and triple somersaults and leapt straight up in the air some fifteen feet off the ground before landing squarely on my feet, somewhat out of breath and wanting to do these tricks some more. But the morning was coming. Only the subtlest change in the air, the sky, but I knew it as if hell's bells were ringing, hell's bells calling the vampire home to the sleep of death. Ah, the melting loveliness of the sky, the loveliness of the vision of dim belfries, and an odd thought came to me that in hell the light of the fires would be so bright it would be like sunlight, and this would be the only sunlight I would ever see again. But what have I done, I thought. I didn't ask for this, I didn't give in. Even when Magnus told me I was dying, I fought him. And yet I am hearing hell's bells now. Well, who gives a damn? When I reached the churchyard quite ready for the ride home, something distracted me. I stood holding the rein of my horse and looking at the small field of graves and could not quite figure what it was. Then again it came and I knew. I felt a distinct presence in the churchyard. I stood so still I heard the blood thundering in my veins. It wasn't human, this presence. It had no scent. And there were no human thoughts coming from it. Rather, it seemed veiled and defended, and it knew I was here. It was watching me. Could I be imagining this? I stood listening, looking. A scattering of grey tombstones poked through the snow. And far away stood a row of old crypts, larger, ornamented, but just as ruined as the stones. It seemed the presence lingered somewhere near the crypts, and then I felt it distinctly as it moved towards the enclosing trees. Who are you? I demanded. I heard my voice like a knife. Answer me, I called out even louder. I felt a great tumult in it, the presence, and I was certain that it was moving away very rapidly. I dashed across the churchyard after it, and I could feel it receding. Yet I saw nothing in the barren forest, and I realized I was stronger than it, and that it had been afraid of me. Well, fancy that, afraid of me, and I had no idea whether or not it was corporeal, vampire the same as I was, or something without a body. Well, one thing is sure, I said, you're a coward. 
tingling in the air. The forest seemed to breathe for an instant. A sense of my own might came over me that had been brewing all along. I was in fear of nothing, not the church, not the dark, not the worms swarming over the corpses in my dungeon. Not even this strange eerie force that had retreated into the forest and seemed to be near at hand again. Not even of men. I was an extraordinary fiend. If I'd been sitting on the steps of hell with my elbows on my knees and the devil had said, Lestat, come, choose the form of the fiend you wish to be to roam the earth. How could I have chosen a better fiend than what I was? And it seemed suddenly that suffering was an idea I'd known in another existence and would never know again. I can't help but laugh now when I think of that first night, especially of that particular moment.